Ever since I started this channel, I've been asked the same question. What was my favorite raid? And one raid in particular immediately comes to mind, and it wasn't just my favorite raid either. It was right in the middle of my favorite playthrough. Unfortunately, this happened years ago, long before I had ever even thought about starting a YouTube channel. I always told myself though that if I ever had the skill, I would find a way to bring this story to life. And so recently I reached out to everyone I had played with on that server and cobbled together every resource we had and rebuilt the entire server from scratch. So, come on in, have a seat and relax while I tell you the tale of not only my favorite raid, but the best playthrough of Conan I've ever had. This story actually begins a few servers prior. It was a private server, the clan I joined was large. The weekend raid was coming soon and they enticed me to join with promises of big raids and conquest. We had farmed up thousands of dragon powder, tons of gear, we were ready to take the server by storm. Except we didn't. My whole clan left to go play the new Path of Exile League the day before raid weekend. But that's neither here nor there. The one clanmate that stayed behind was a man named Jumpy who you've probably seen in my other videos. This is the server he and I actually met, and since he and I were the only two that actually farmed up most of that dragon powder, we figured, hey, those guys were clowns, but we could probably do some work if we went and rolled as a duo. And so we did. We went from server to server, picking fights and raiding larger clans. We had a similar outlook on the game, too. Slower and more strategic. We weren't interested in raiding sandstone for cheap thrills or grubbing fights outside obelisks for cheap gear. We were perfectly okay with grinding our way to the end game and going after the big fish. We were met with mixed success. To put it bluntly, Jumpy and I have been through some shit in this game. But the takeaway is that over the course of all of our hours, we had learned many painful lessons, like not to show up in the Alpha Clan's event log unless we were ready to fight. In the server just before this video, I made a mistake and robbed the wrong man. We got wiped in maybe 15 minutes flat. We went from the top of the world to a sandstone shack on New River with a hostile rhinoceros thrusting his head into the wall. This was the most important lesson of all. In Conan, defeat can come quick, and a single mistake can cost you everything. This is the first of three elements that came together to give us our perfect playthrough. We had earned the game knowledge necessary for success through plenty of suffering, and we were hungry for a victory. The second piece of the puzzle came after that painful wipe. Jumpy and I had been cooling off from the game after that miserable defeat, but being the addict I am, I would still log in to mess around. In the thousands of hours I've spent playing Conan, I spent at least a thousand of those hours just flying around in god mode and single player, looking for base locations. Scouting out hidey holes, finding cracks in the wall where I could build a bomb factory, crucial information for people like myself. I never used YouTube guides because logically, if a hidey hole video has 40,000 views on it, it's probably not that good of a hidey hole anymore, is it? And one day, I hit the jackpot. High above the ground, nearly at the top of the volcano, I found this. A large vertical cave, large enough to be incredibly spacious, and because the cave went straight down, it was invisible from the ground, even if you filled it to the brim with structure and purpose. People know this location as the Ant Hill now, but this was long before it was ever featured in any YouTube videos. So I knew I just found something huge. I could fucking come from the cave I just found. Cheeky. So now we had the knowledge, we had our base location, now all we needed was an opportunity. And we were about to be handed one on a silver platter. The third piece of the puzzle is what can only be described as the luckiest start I've ever had in probably any game ever. At the time, Jumpy and I weren't playing, so I was just poking around servers and doing some snooping. 
I had noticed the server would occasionally become fairly populated, so I was doing the rounds, just exploring, seeing what I could see, no real goal in mind, and no intention of staying either unless something caught my eye, of course. I was just outside the city of the Relic Hunters when I saw it. I had only been on the server for maybe a half hour, so I was only maybe level 15, but I saw a fat tier 3 base right next to the city. Being the nosy little rat that I am, I ran right up to it, and I'll confess, I don't even really remember what this base looked like, because the moment I reached the door, my adrenaline spiked and stayed that way for the rest of the night. It was decayed. For those of you that don't play Conan, when a structure hasn't been visited by its owner in a certain amount of time, it becomes abandoned, which allows any passerby to dismantle the structure and take whatever's inside. I knew that in an area this highly trafficked, if I didn't rob this place right now, I would miss my shot. So even though I was not high enough of a level to carry anything and didn't have a place to store it, I ripped off the front door and rushed inside. And the base was fucking loaded. Boxes of supplies, steel fire, crafting thralls, weapons, absolutely everything I would ever need. But even all that would be nothing in comparison to one little box. One unassuming little chest on the second floor, quietly radiating potential from the corner. I almost didn't even see it at first, but when I cracked it open, I found the loot that would most characterize this entire playthrough. A box entirely of Archpriests, well over 20 of them, Set Priests, Jevil Sag Priests. I didn't even look at them all. I just grabbed as many as I could and I messaged Jumby. It was time. For those of you that don't play Conan, Archpriests are an essential component of summoning gods, and gods are the ultimate destructive weapons in the game. <laughs> Everywhere they go, they leave destruction in their wake. What I had just found was the Conan equivalent to a box full of nukes, and like a kid in a candy shop, I grabbed everything I could fit into my pockets and demolished the rest of the base, leaving no trace of what just happened. I was too encumbered to run or walk, so I just rolled my way over the ridge and behind a rock while I frantically messaged Jumby about all the loot I got. Getting this loot safe was our top priority, so he set out to quickly farm up enough sandstone to toss together a rudimentary structure at our secret hideout, and then we waited until like 3 in the morning for the server to be empty before we literally rolled all the way from Supermaru to the volcano in a process that took an absurd amount of time before beginning the dangerous climb. We had wrestled up just enough warm clothing for us to not freeze to death in the cold, but we didn't even have any climbing gear, so we scaled our way up the cliff by building foundations periodically and then breaking them behind us to hide our tracks. I can't even begin to describe the sigh of relief when we finally made it to the top and secured our loot. I'm pretty sure we didn't even move for like an hour or two, we just sat there and stared at all the loot that we had squeezed into our shitty little base. It was only a sandstone queue, but we were so confident nobody would find us up here, and with what we had obtained, we knew this run was going to be crazy. Jumby and I made a few renovations with our loot while we figured out the server politics. We knew how to ceiling stack at this point, but given the shape of the cave, we just couldn't be bothered, and we figured it would take up a lot of the usable space anyways, so we just didn't. We figured that the real strength of this location would be in how hard it is to find, and decided to prioritize stealth rather than even worrying about honeycombing. All in all, even with a base fully constructed, it would have only cost maybe 20 bombs to raid completely. 
And keep that number in mind too, because it gets funnier as the video goes on. But we were careful. Every time we made modifications to the base, we made sure someone was at the base of the cliff scouting for other players, so that falling objects wouldn't give our location away. And also to eyeball the base location to make sure no building pieces were sticking out. When coming home, we made sure to warp to the Black Keep obelisk and to the Volcano obelisk interchangeably, to prevent someone who sees us warping somewhere from guessing where we're headed. We built farm shacks and drop sites all over the map to reduce our foot traffic to the main base. Because I work night shift, I would typically make the rounds at around 3 in the morning and empty all the shacks, making sure nobody could follow us home. If we encountered anyone in the wild, we'd hide or evade them, not because we didn't want any conflict, but because we knew the less of a presence we had, the better. We were running a tight ship, not even stealing so much as a single fish from any clan. We didn't want anyone to know we even existed until it was time to strike, and hopefully by then, it would be too late. But as we explored the server and rounded out our farming needs, we noticed something very peculiar about this server. Namely, that the Alpha Clan was everywhere. Every single base, every castle. It got to the point where when we found a base, we knew it was owned by them before we even checked. The pillars, the plains, in the snow, in the jungle, and they weren't just bases either, they were humongous. I can't stress enough the scale of these monuments. I had to scale them back to get them to render in single player without lagging up my whole PC. Clearly this clan hadn't had any real competition in a long, long time. Which was just fine for us. We had a box full of nukes back home and a server full of targets. What more could you ask for? Although it did complicate things. See, typically we would do our homework. Scout, over-scout, and then scout some more so that when we made our move, we could go for the jugular and take out as much of a clan's power as possible before they even realized what was happening. But this clan, called the Prophecy, had so many bases, a single decisive strike just wasn't possible. Even all along the highlands, there were just chains of vaults. On the bright side, after our last few disappointing runs, this server was going to be spicy. At the time, we were using a placeholder clan name until we could think of something more appropriate. But we needed something great before we struck. Looking at all the bases we had to raid reminded me in a weird sort of way of that really terrible Stephen King movie. We'd be like those otherworldly enemies that swooped in to eat up the world and clean everything up. It was too perfect to not use. A reference just goofy enough to fit us perfectly while also encapsulating precisely what we were here to do. And so the Langoliers were born, and we were here to clean up this server. We got to work planning our first strike. Taking them out in a single move wouldn't be possible, so we wanted to make a big play to kick off the war. Something that would rattle them and make them take us seriously. And we had just the target in mind. Just outside New Azagarth was this monstrosity of a base. For my computer's sake, I didn't construct this perfectly one-to-one. -one, but on the server, they had fully paved over this entire area of foundations like a Walmart parking lot. It was just a gigantic, ugly, laggy eyesore. You couldn't even get near New Azagarth without enjoying single-digit FPS and insane server lag. It stretched from the city to the dam with a pillar base on top, all the way to the keyhole, further north and beyond. Underwater vaults, honeycomb structures, an absurd amount of pets and thralls. The works. This was before thrall limits, of course, so every base they had was swarming with NPCs. And right at the heart of this beast was a gigantic, ugly Chinese pagoda. Do you think maybe he's compensating for something? <laughs> <laughs> It was the perfect target. We practiced in single player and proved that you could hit the tower with set, which we had plenty of Archpriests for. So we had our god and we had the base, we just needed a plan. Before we can get to that though, let me give you the details on god summoning. In order to summon one, you have to kill 500 human beings, ritually harvest their organs, put them on ice so they don't spoil because that organ you left in a box will go bad if you leave it out in the sun all day. And gods won't take old hand-me-down hearts. And then you have to craft those organs into special religious items on an altar, which will grant you zeal, which is then used to craft the god token. But a god can only be summoned from a tier 3 altar, which itself requires a number of zeal, as well as some tier 2 and tier 3 building materials. So all in all, you're looking at a solid amount of building materials and 605 ritually slaughtered human beings. Along with, of course, an archpriest who will themselves be sacrificed to give you the final result, which also consumes the altar along with it. It's a costly procedure, and to make things worse, Tier 3 altars and the resultant god coins will mark your location on the map for everyone to see. Announcing to the server exactly what you're up to. Not exactly what I'd call stealthy. So the trouble for us is we had to figure out how to quietly craft a god and work it into their base without blowing our cover. A seemingly impossible task. Or was it? We had a question that needed answering. Is it possible to use somebody else's altar to summon a god? It's a fair question. 
After all, you can't use another clan's trebuchet, it'll say that you can't interact with it. But technically, altars work more like crafting stations, and you can use another clan's crafting station, so theoretically, it should work, right? Making the matter more enticing was the fact that the Prophecy had numerous bases with exposed Tier 3 altars, and many of them already had enough zeal inside to summon a god, meaning we wouldn't have to do any farming at all. I'm sure this would have been a deterrent for most clans, a sort of don't hit us we have gods ready kind of move. But if we could use their own altars against them, not only would we rob them of their god, but we would be gaining our own for free. It would be like telling them to stop hitting themselves, but on a cosmic scale. So we were going to build a god and the alphas were going to pay for it. We had the perfect altar in mind too, just outside the Silkwood was a quiet, largely unused farming base. All it had was a small interior structure, a wall, and a few dump faults. The perimeter wall was easy to climb over right where it runs into the cliff, so getting into the compound would be easy. Easier still, the central structure that had a few crafter thralls and a tier 3 altar with 500 favor had no anti-climb and no doors either. Clearly this clan had grown lazy and complacent. It was time for a wake up call. Additionally, there was a map room outside the compound, so we could craft the token here, teleport to the Black Keep, run it all the way to the Pagoda, and hopefully drop the coin before anyone even noticed. A 10 minute operation, and if it worked, we'd have successfully stolen a god and remodeled one of their most vain constructs. That is, if it worked. There was only one way to find out. In hindsight, we probably could have just tested this in co-op mode rather than risking a raid over it, but fortune favors the bold, as they say. We started crafting the token before raid hours, so we wouldn't have to fight any of the thralls on the way in. Those last few seconds of waiting were like torture. Staring at it, sweating, fidgeting nervously until finally, I had the coin in my pocket. It worked. You'll never know how stressful it is to run into alpha territory with a god in your pocket unless you've done it. Strike after strike, I was hitting that base, trampling thralls underneath me on the way, I couldn't wait to see this stupid Chinese penis fall away. But it, uh, didn't. Something wasn't right. Raiding was active, we knew it was, because I'd killed a bunch of thralls on the way in and punched a hole through their walls and ruined the anti-client, but the tower, it didn't budge. On my screen I was hitting it, and on Jumbie's screen I was hitting it, so what gives? When we moved into the base, we could both tell that something was very wrong. All of the thralls that had survived were attacking me, but none of them were dealing any damage. It was like I had obtained god mode. And when I tried to inspect the damage to the structure, nothing showed up. Curiously, Jumbie was still taking damage from the thralls, so I knew I had been decent in some way. I still tried to get into the central tower since the front doors were off. Clearly some damage had been done, but I couldn't move at all inside. And then, the server crashed. It took me, I kid you not, three and a half hours to reconnect to the game. Jumbie thankfully got in a lot sooner, but this whole server took a fat dump. Everybody was lagging. This base was so large, so laggy, and had so many foundations, and the tower was so honeycombed, it literally couldn't process all the damage at once. We were later told from the people in Prophecy that the base would not even load in for them for the next week. We did manage to go bomb out some of their underwater vaults while stalling for time, but once Prophecy noticed what we had done, they and their allies swarmed us. It goes without saying that this was not our finest raid. Imagine building a base too laggy to raid. If you've ever wondered why Funcom started banning people for building intentionally laggy bases, this is a prime example. The first of them to arrive on the scene was somebody from their allied clan, literally called Big Dick Clan. Contrary to their name, their behavior exclusively radiated small dick energy, since they spend the rest of the playthrough operating as the Alpha's lapdog. Jumpy and I took one look at each other and knew we'd have to raid them both. This wasn't quite the operation that we were hoping for though. It wasn't a total loss after all, I mean the god was free. The only thing we really lost was the element of surprise, and unfortunately for a clan of two people against a clan of over 10 counting allies, that was kinda big. And unfortunately, because it had gone so poorly, they were insufferably smug. 
They'd go on to brag about this raid after the fact later in their Discord. As it turns out though, we would slap that smug tone right out of their mouths a lot sooner than they would expect. Oh, and uh, if you're wondering how I have screenshots from inside their Discord, we'll get there. Needless to say, this plot thickens quite a bit by the end, so stay tuned. Still, we had to send a message, not just to Prophecy, but to their slave clans and to the rest of the server. With another enemy clan added to the mix and the element of surprise thoroughly squandered, we came up with an even bigger plan, something even more bold. A raid large enough to show the whole server what we were made of. What follows is easily my favorite raid I've ever done in Conan Exiles. But first, some Conan history. God coins or god tokens are the item that you use to summon gods. Once they're crafted, they're on a timer. If you don't use them, you lose them. This prevents somebody from just holding onto a bunch of them and then unleashing them instantly when needed. The thing is, Funcom has never been very diligent with their coding. And so this game has had many a colorful bug over the years. This game has refrigerators that, when stocked with ice, prevent food items from decaying. Pets and thralls similarly used to not allow food items to decay in their inventory. So you could give them food and not worry about it rotting overnight. Only trouble is, as you've probably guessed, for a time, it was possible to put god tokens in refrigerators and thrall inventories and they wouldn't decay. <laughs> Imagine putting a nuke in the fridge to chill overnight. Funcom did fix this bug later though. When we came to this server though, we were in between those two developments. It was no longer possible to store god coins in that way, but coins that had been stored before the fix hadn't been removed yet and they were still in play. And there were two on the map. One inside a pillar base owned by the Prophecy and another inside a base owned by Big Dick Clan in Heliograph Heights. It was almost too perfect. The plan practically made itself. We'd be raiding both our enemies while denuclearizing the entire map, using their own weapons against them, and if we played our cards right, we could hit several bases in one night and really send the message that we were here to stay. As far as I understand it, many of the bases owned by Prophecy were left behind by other clans that moved to other servers, and this was one such base. It was still guarded by Thralls, of course, but it wasn't likely to have any players inside, which is what was important. We needed to hit this one first because it had a god token for Jebel Sog inside, which would be the best god for hitting the jungle base since it was at the top of Heliograph Heights, and Jebel Sog was a fast flying god. One of the biggest reasons I didn't mind rebuilding this server for the video is because it's actually not the first time we've done this. In fact, we built a lot of their bases in single player to make sure we had our timing perfect. And once we were satisfied that we could get into that pillar base with Yogg, we scouted the next base. This one would be a bit trickier. Heliograph Heights is one of the highest pillars in the game. We would need climbing gear to get to the top, but there was also a large perimeter wall and anti-climb to contend with. But this is why we do our homework. We discovered a hole in the anti-climb at the very back of the wall, so we could get over that at least. And there was no staircase from the wall to the ground, so any thralls in the courtyard would be unable to follow us up. And if you see here, the main pillar had several layers of anti-climb, but the pillar next to it only had one, and both pillars were connected by a bridge at the top. It was less about raiding materials and more about time. We'd very likely be operating under duress with very little time to spare, so the fastest way to the top would be the best. After that, we developed a greater raid strategy that we would use for most of the war, where we would scout and make raid plans for every base we saw on the server. That way, if we encountered any resistance, we could pivot and hit another base before they realized what happened. It's one of the greatest strengths of running as a small group. It's very easy to change your plans on the fly. We even went so far as to build a number of hidden map rooms around the world, including a few hidden under the water, so we always had somewhere to run to if we had to lose a pursuer or change targets. So the plan was this. We'd farm up a Yogg and build the altar for it as close to the pillar base as possible, so that the god coin would hide our altar on the map, hopefully. We brought a map room with us so we could hit the pillar base, retrieve the Jebel Sod coin, and then immediately warp to the jungle. We didn't even plan on looting the pillar base since we knew speed was our strength. But just in case we had anything, we built a drop site of vaults in between the obelisk and our second target, so we could depot if we need to. Once at the jungle base, we would circle around the back, climb over the wall, and then use explosive and gas arrows to remove the anti-climb around the shorter pillar, then take the bridge over to the main compound and got it from there. That way, we wouldn't lose any efficiency with our god summon. After that, we'd take the coin from inside this base and use it on a tertiary target. We had a number of smaller bases picked out around the map, nowhere in particular. And even after that, we hoped to hit a number of slave wheels owned by our opponents, specifically one of the volcano. It was set to be a huge operation, but we were eager to get our revenge and put the Alpha's lapdog back in their place. Their winky faces would not go unpunished. The day finally came. Prophecy and Big Dick Clan had been talking shit all week, but they couldn't find our base. Even as we waited on our tier 3 altar, ready to risk it all, they assured us our destruction was coming. 
We had our response ready and were nervously waiting to give it. But we had a lot riding on this raid. Several weeks of planning as well as a god that we had farmed up from scratch. Failing now would be a painful defeat. Jumbie summoned this one just like we had practiced, aiming for the side of the structure to remove the anti-climb and expose the inner floors. There was a map room inside the pillar too, which meant we didn't need to go to our map room to escape, buying us some time to do some looting. We decided to bomb out some of the vaults inside and kill some of the thralls while we waited for a response. That way we'd be sure that they were at the pillar and not at the jungle base. Eventually, we made our way upstairs, and sure enough, the god coin was in a refrigerator that was still untouched. As soon as we heard noises outside, we left and moved to phase two. Nobody from Big Dick Clan was online yet, but most of Prophecy was, and they arrived on the scene shortly after we did, except they didn't know how to get over the wall like we did. And with nobody from Big Dick Clan online, nobody could open the gate for them. We used their own base's defenses against them to stall for time while I blasted the anti-climb from below. Jumbie kept them busy and slowed them down, while I continued to blast the anti-climb. As soon as the anti-climb was gone, I went up with the coin. But we were running out of time. Prophecy had figured out the hole in the anticlimb sooner than expected and Jumbie was fighting them off valiantly, stalling for those last few seconds I needed. I climbed as fast as I could while he stalled and hoped that they wouldn't shoot me down. Jumbie fought until his last breath and died a hero's death on the wall, stalling their entire team just as I rounded the gate on the bridge and then the fighting stopped. The Prophecy and I both realized then and there that without climbing gear, they wouldn't be able to reach the top in time to stop me. And even if they could, they were just too far. It was too late. This one moment continues to be my favorite moment in Conan Exiles. The sun setting over the horizon, revenge on the tips of my fingers. The knowledge that most of the Alpha Clan was there, but all they could do was sit there and watch. I made sure to angle it so that I could kill every thrall inside. We didn't even care about structural damage, we just wanted that god coin. Jumbie quickly respect for grit and got his climbing gear to return. Prophecy had left to do the same, but took a lot longer. We went through and killed every single thrall I missed with the god. Even finding their clan mates holed up in the other building and slaughtered them sleeping in their beds. We even had time to bomb out a few of the vaults that were at the top of the pillar and do some looting. An entire room was filled with tanners, alchemists, and crafter thralls. Cleaning these rats out felt great. Unfortunately, we never got that god coin. Because there was so much structure damage and so many dead thralls, the inventories of the thralls wouldn't load due to lag. So we just had to settle for denying it to their team while we watched the bodies despawn, taking that exploited god token with them. 
and before Prophecy could even mount a response, we were already on the move to our next target. We had these guys running around like chickens with their heads cut off, and they could not keep up. We went home and depoted all our loot, and then went out for the third base, a smaller base by the green wall in the jungle, but they didn't even respond to this one. I guess it's harder to keep track of somebody when they don't have a marker on their head. We cleaned it out and immediately went to the volcano to clean out the crack shacks there. I'll be honest with you, I don't even remember all the smaller shacks we raided that night. What's important is that Prophecy wasn't able to defend a single thing. It was a full sweep. And we did it all without even a single hiccup. Minus the one lost coin. We successfully wiped three bases and countless other smaller shacks while simultaneously removing every illegal god coin from the map. What really made it worthwhile though, what really sent this one home for me, was after the fact, when the guy who originally talked shit from Big Dick Clan logged in later that day and had an absolute fit when he saw what we did to his base. Oh man, where are the thralls? We killed them and ate their livers. <laughs> I can't tell you how satisfying it is to see someone that smug laid so low. This was the moment the war really started. The moment the server knew things were happening. And while we enjoyed our victory and reveled in our loot, the alphas were disturbingly quiet. We didn't quite know it yet, but we had just set into motion a chain of events that would spiral out of control. We didn't realize what we had just done. The clan we had been fighting called the Prophecy, by some strange coincidence had come to believe in something of a prophecy all their own. Long before our time on the server, a war had been lost. A clan by the name of Lotax had attempted a war with another faction without the Prophecy's approval. And though they said they'd stay out of it, they threatened to attack if Lotax didn't move their base and cease hostilities. Ask Jack, a member of Lotax, exchanged heated words with the Prophecy, inviting their anger. They responded by godding Lotax repeatedly, quickly overwhelming them and wiping their base along with everything they had, splitting their clan in the process. And although the war had ended, Ask Jack swore that one day he'd get his revenge, even if he had to pay server wipers to help him. It was only a bluff, but those words hung in the air as a quiet, uneasy peace settled across the server enforced by Prophecy's insurmountable numbers. And while Prophecy didn't believe he would follow through on that promise just yet, it wasn't long after that that we arrived on the scene. We had, by pure chance, managed to fulfill this prophecy perfectly. Asjack promises to pay professional server wipers to come and end Prophecy. And then suddenly two mysterious strangers appear out of nowhere, conjuring gods out of thin air day after day, while wiping bases at every corner of the map and only ever seeming to attack Prophecy and their allies. And no matter how hard Prophecy scouted, these two strangers couldn't be found anywhere. Like the Spanish coming to Central America, we had accidentally fulfilled some greater story. Well, it was a bit more like the Road to El Dorado, where a couple of clowns managed to meme their way into a position of power through sheer luck. If Prophecy had any idea how badly we had been wiped on just the last server, this whole mythos of professional server wipers would have fallen apart immediately. But the prophecy had been fulfilled as far as the Alphas were concerned, which is why their response to our raid made no sense to us at the time. They never once believed that we were our own force pursuing our own interests. In their paranoid minds, we were paid agents, puppets on the strings of Asjack's master plan. How did we get all those raid materials and gods so quickly? Well, clearly we were being financed by somebody, obviously. And why couldn't they find our base? Well, somebody on the server was harboring us. It all made too much sense. And so they responded to our raid not by striking back against us, not that they could, but by purging every other clan on the server that wasn't openly hostile to us. Sooner or later they thought they'd find out where we were hiding. Base after base fell, succumbing to Prophecy's paranoid madness. Innocent clans that had nothing to do with our war were swept up in it. Sandstone bases, solo clans, duos, and of course low tags. And every time in the smoldering remains of each raid, 
we would be there, in the shadows, picking up the pieces, offering our hand in friendship, resources to rebuild, and most importantly, a chance at revenge. Their actions would ironically turn this prophecy of theirs into a self-fulfilling one. Slowly but surely, the server would turn against them. One atrocity in particular stuck out in the minds of many on the server, the tale of Snugs the Defiant. I am eternally glad that there is existing footage of this base, because if I were to try to explain to you how large this man's base was, I don't think you'd believe me, and he built it all himself. This is the base of Snugalicious. He was once a member of Low Tax, but he had split off into his own team with a few other members where he lived peacefully after the first war with Prophecy. He would stream his desktop to his work laptop, so on slow days he would just farm and build, living his best life. He was on good terms with everybody and everybody knew not to load into the sinkhole obelisk or your computer would fry. Hundreds of thralls, pets, and a gigantic castle. Soon though, of course, Prophecy came for him, and with a base this large, they were convinced we would be hiding in it somewhere. God after God, this peaceful solo built base was griefed by a toxic alpha clan suffering from paranoid delusions. And they never found anybody inside. But this base was so large that Snugs himself would even forget what he had inside. At one point he even sent us a screenshot much later in the war saying, Hey, I forgot this vault in here. It was a uh, wall behind the foundations. There's some mats you can have. <laughs> Which was hilarious. A base so large that you forget how many vaults you have buried inside. But day after day, Prophecy would come back, bomb it, raid it, got it, until eventually they gave up. It was just too large and there was no trace of us anywhere. Snugs had nothing to do with us at that point. All they had done was grief a solo player. And what did Snugs do? He farmed and he built. In his own way, he had conquered the Alphas before anyone else did through his own stubborn spirit. And of course, the punchline is he wasn't working with us at all until after Prophecy raided him. And once they gave up wiping him, we did actually start using the skeleton of his base as a drop site, setting up a few fridges for God favor in the ruins where they wouldn't find it. As for Snugs, he rebuilt his base. And rumor has it, he continues to build to this day, massive monuments and highways across maps. Though now he's on a PvE server where he can't get griefed by clans like Prophecy any longer. And while all that suffering was going on, we were a million miles away having the time of our lives. Still riding the high from our last big operation, we were eager to do it again, and the Prophecy was never short on targets for us. We had set our sights on an absolutely massive base just northwest of the Dead Mounds, with a wall so large you couldn't even load it in in one sitting, and it appeared to be themed, filled with undead and lit only with witch fire. I liked this base a lot actually, as I'm a man who appreciates his calcium, so anything with skeletons makes me happy, but there was that pesky matter of the base's ownership. Like every prophecy perimeter wall, there was a hole in the anticlimb somewhere, so getting in was easy and as always. There was an exposed tier 3 altar on the roof, so you already know. We got it twice in one day, sourcing the other altar from a crack shack outside the Dead Mountains. We toppled the back tower and flattened the central portion. And even though the prophecy responded, the base was so huge they had trouble even finding us. So we bombed out any chests we could find, evaded them, and made our escape. This base was so huge though, we couldn't raid it in one go. So we made a mental note to come back. Raid after raid, we were taking it to them. Slave wheels, bases, even the fishing houses. No base was too big and no shack was too small. If it was owned by prophecy or their allies, we made a move. And every time we succeeded, they went more and more insane, raiding randoms across the server trying to find us and never succeeding. We were just too quick. It got to the point where we started carrying around map rooms in our pockets so that if we were ever caught out of position, or we needed to pivot to a new target, we could just drop it and like a ninja's puff of smoke be gone in an instant. We were driving them insane. 
It was around this time that we started to pick up some of Prophecy's victims and bring them into the fold. Ask Jack and his team had touched bases with us and invited us into their Discord, where we turned our new alliance into a well-oiled machine. We'd organize drop sites, share farm routes, and update our plans daily. And if we encountered anybody near a drop site, we would just consider it compromised and relocate it, always keeping Prophecy on their toes. After killing several of them by the North Jungle, we abandoned that site permanently and left a dummy drop site of empty vaults for them to waste bombs on, which of course they did. Always mind gaming them, striking where they least expect it. Sometimes we'd have our allies bomb one place to create a diversion while we hit a different base. The more bodies we had, the more mayhem we caused. And all throughout the war, we made sure to find prophecy altars to use against them. They were so sloppy with it, it came to the point where we would bomb random structures and just find altars all by themselves, unupgraded but with favor inside. Likely the relics of a long lost war, repurposed for our own designs. We cracked one of these open on a day where we raided a different place, so that the damage would be lost in their event log and they wouldn't notice. Then the next day, we used it to summon Jebel Sog in their volcano base. It was raid after raid after raid. Our loot room had chests stacked higher and higher until eventually we were almost out of room. It was a good time to be a Lingalier. After some of those raids, we brought another prophecy victim into the fold. A clan called the Sticky Bandits, built over the Jebel Sog teacher. They, like the others, were truthfully not involved in the war even in the smallest of ways, but Prophecy ruthlessly wiped them looking for us, giving us another two teammates in the process. Marimusa and Misgeek, master thieves. They had unreasonably good talents for getting into bases and robbing them blind. Even bases that I would have trouble getting into, they'd already be robbing it before I could even ask for help. Every Discord notification followed the same style. Hey, I found a base. Hey, I got inside. Hey, can you help me carry a loot? Also, I found some of them asleep. Not long after we recruited them, Snugs was hit by Prophecy, so he and his friends joined us as well. Sticky Bandits running recon, performing acts of theft and assisting us on raids, Assjack, Mantok, Snuggalicious, Blaze, Old Man Brink, Buffalo, and Jen from Low Tax and Snugs team would join us as extra muscle and would run distractions while Jumbie and I used our game knowledge to pull off riskier and riskier raids. The odds weren't so uneven anymore, and every day our team just got stronger. This is of course also how we got our Discord screenshots. There was a server discord that Jumby and I were never invited to for obvious reasons, so Prophecy would raid people that they used to be friends with in this discord, but then fail to ban them, so we had eyes on every move they made for most of the war. Though I'll confess, we mostly used those eyes to take screenshots of their suffering and laugh as they panicked. At this point though, they were really losing it. They started accusing us of undermeshing, duping, cheating, everything in the book, which we of course teased them about the entire war. They were so desperate they started to send our allies cryptic messages claiming to have found our alleged undermesh base. Though they curiously never seemed to have any screenshots or proof of this, likely trying to bait us into giving up our actual location, but unlike Prophecy, we weren't stupid. What also might have happened, perhaps one of them did climb the volcano, and at a certain point up the cliff, you can see through the rocks and see if there is a base at the anthill. It probably didn't happen this way, they were probably just bluffing, but how hilarious would it have been if they got that close and just gave up thinking we were cheaters instead of climbing the final 20 feet? At some point it even became clear that we had a spy in Asjack's Discord. We caught the man and kicked him out. You'd think that if they had a spy in our Discord they'd know where our base was, but like I said, we're not stupid. Nobody was allowed to type the base location, only discuss it in voice. There were never any pictures posted and we swapped drop sites frequently. We didn't even allow anybody to leave a set of climbing gear on the ground, much less cold resistance gear. We didn't want to leave them any hints whatsoever. Our game was so tight, not even a man on the inside could sell us out. <laughs> and get this, the reason we caught him was because he tried to photoshop a message from one of our allies, Jen, to make it look like she was trying to betray us, in a move that came straight out of the mind of a 5th grader with no idea of how living people actually behave. So she of course showed us the actual conversations and we knew exactly who it was. He sold himself out basically, even Prophecy's spies were stupid. Clearly though, these guys were desperate. The prophecy itself was slowly coming true. Of course it wasn't all smooth sailing though, we had ups and downs in our attempts. The trouble with trying to make use of enemy altars is that sometimes they catch you. We had mustered up quite a few of us to use an altar owned by the Sumerians, a clan that didn't play on the server anymore. We upgraded it and were waiting pensively, but under the cover of night, one of Prophecy's members noticed the altar upgraded, ran over and stole our Archpriest from the altar, cancelling it. We weren't able to catch him either, he just ran into the sunset with our hopes and dreams. One of the Sumerians logged in later and was like, I don't remember that being tier 3. I'm gonna pretend it was an act of charity. A second time we tried using a Jebel Sog altar on top of one of the prophecy bases at Noob River. A big Aqualonian structure that to give credit where credit is due was gorgeous, but they caught us and fought us off. And you might think, why even risk it at that point? Why insist on stealing the altars? Why not just make your own? Well like I said before, stealing gods just 
feels good. I enjoy theft, but it served a strategic purpose as well. If we created a new altar on the map, it would be marked with an icon Prophecy could see, and they'd know we're coming. By insisting on using theirs, we always had the element of surprise since nothing on the map ever changed until hopefully it was too late. The best part about it all though is that even when they fought us off, even when we lost in combat, because they could never find our base, they weren't winning, they were just losing a little bit slower. It was impossible to be upset by setbacks because it was always just a matter of trying again tomorrow. Stress-free domination of an alpha clan, you don't get to see that too often. Although, I do need to take a second and clear my conscience. Things were getting pretty hectic in this war, and I made a bit of a fool of myself. I don't even remember what the context was, but one of our raids had gotten tits up. I was in the volcano, running to what I thought was a prophecy base with a stolen Jebel Saga in my pockets, and prophecy was pretty close behind me. Not so close that they could hit me, I had a, maybe a 30 second lead, but still close enough that I didn't want them to have the god token, so rather than give it to them, I figured I'd waste it on one of their smaller bases. So I popped it as quickly as I could, and I died before finishing the summon, but I got most of it off. Except that when I went back to survey the damage, it was owned by the Crusaders. Now, the Crusaders were a neutral faction, and we respected that choice. We weren't savages, we were just here for the Alpha Clan. So I went over to their base to apologize, and I gave them some materials to rebuild to show I wasn't just being a snake and lying about it, and they, they bought it, they believed me. But then I did it a second time, at a different base that I swore was prophecies. I mean, every base on this map was prophecies. It was an honest mistake, but I didn't even check before hitting it, so I didn't really have an excuse. And at this point, I was like, I told Jumbi, I'm like, they're never going to believe me. What have I done? It was to the point where Jumbi was like, man, dude, if you want to raid them, dude, we can just raid him. We don't have to be coy about it. And I told him, I'm I, serious. It was an accident. I, I respect their neutrality. So I went back with more stuff. And this time they were so wary of me. <laughs> like, you don't typically accidentally god people twice. I know, I'm sorry. I don't know what to say. Yeah, uh, lots of thralls in that base. Very time consuming to replace. I know, I don't know what I'm doing. They didn't hold it against me, which I appreciate, but I can prove that these were both accidents, okay? I have the proof. So I shit you not, not only was Prophecy accusing us of cheating, undermeshing and all of that, sending us Photoshop Discord pics to try to smear our friends, raiding solo players to find us out of their own paranoia, but their scumbag allies from Big Dick Clan actually approached us and tried to buy peace by selling the Crusaders out. I shit you not, these scumbags gave us the location of your volcano vault base, and let the record show that even though we knew about your secret volcano base, we never hit it. And if we really wanted to go after your loot, or if we really wanted a war with you guys, that's where we would have hit. So even even though it does look pretty bad that I accidentally got at you guys uh, twice, let it be known that it truly was and always will be an accident. We truly did respect your wishes to remain neutral, though the jury's still out on whether or not I can legally classify myself as a human being with how provably low my IQ is, but that's uh, another matter. I still don't know if they wanted to buy peace, or maybe they were just pissed at the Crusaders for not helping them in the war, but they were the ones who approached us with these cryptic hints of there being an important base at the top of the volcano, hoping we'd go for it. Maybe they were trying for some weird alliance, or some shifting of allegiances. But I gotta be honest with you, this sort of backroom dealing, shifting alliances, Game of Thrones type shit is, uh, really cringe. So when they gave us this info, we were just like, uh, not only are we not interested, but I'd like to make a counteroffer that your whole clan fucking blow me. Uh, also, we're coming for the other base, which we did. Big Dick Clan had another base at the Jungle Pillars, just south of Heliograph Heights. It was like a miniature version of their other base with no large structures on the pillars themselves, so our target was the central structure that we knew was filled with vaults. This raid wound up being hilarious, because Big Dick Clan and Prophecy were both online and defending this base, but because we hit it at night, there was just so much confusion. Their thralls would be attacking each other, some would be hitting Prophecy, and Big Dick Clan would chase them thinking that that was us, and they killed each other more than they killed either of us. In fact, I don't think either of us ever died. We'd run through a door, loop around, and then run right back through it, and they just keep running back. Or we'd duck under one of the bridges and hide under the water while they ran past, only to re-emerge and drop a couple more bombs in the vaults, slowly whittling them down. At one point, we even were, we were climbing to the top of the jungle pillar and just rolling bombs off the side, so they would think we're bombing one side of the base when we were on the other side. It was like an episode of Scooby-Doo, we just kept losing them. Eventually, we managed to blow up every single vault, bomb by bomb, and none of us died. We hopped the wall, and on the way out, we still heard Prophecy and Big Dick Clan fighting each other, even though we had left. Icing on the cake, we used the same underwater map room that we used when we hit their other base. They just never got rid of it.
Another gigantic base hollowed out by the Langoliers. Not one quarter of the map was left unmarked by a ruined base or the shadow of a summoned god. The writing was on the wall. Raid after raid, victory after victory, even when we were fought off, it was only delaying the inevitable. In the waning hours of this war, it would become increasingly obvious who would be the victors. The prophecy was coming true. The Lankaliers at this point were becoming a serious force. Not only were our hit and run tactics on point, but we started to organize better as a raiding team, rather than a series of distractions and lucky strikes. We gathered up the team for one of our largest organized strikes yet. The gigantic, undead-filled winter base that we had already guided twice still had riches inside, but with prophecy on the prowl it became nearly impossible to strike again with pure luck, and we had begun to exhaust the exposed altars on the map for free summons. With new muscle on the team though, we attempted a much bolder strategy. Constructing two altars directly outside the base, still making use of the set arch priest I got in the very beginning. But this time we had to farm up all the zeal and building materials from scratch. We were risking a lot to make this move. At one point, one of Prophecy's guys got into one of the altar rooms due to somebody leaving a door open and Old Man Brink, one of our new members, dropped him like a sack of potatoes before he could even reach the altar. Our communication was getting better, and we had the muscle to make moves. Raid hours finally came and we launched the attack. We went for something of a bait and switch. A raid bunker was built on the opposite side of the base from our altars. Once the coins were cooked, I carried them to that bunker, so while they focused on assaulting the now empty shacks, I could catch them by surprise and flank them with the summon. Turns out though, Set is not only the god of serpents and magic, but also planking. As I came over the hill, instead of angling downwards or sinking into the groove the base was built into, he stayed perfectly rigid and hit, uh, just about nothing except the outer wall. The second god token I managed to get inside the base. Wreaking havoc, trampling thralls, only to have the timer cut short. Our raid bunker wasn't thick enough to protect against an acid arrow cloud, so someone on Prophecy's team thought quick and smoked us out. We didn't know at the time that acid clouds could deal damage through gas masks. They were still fairly new at the time. It was a painful lesson to learn in the middle of a big raid. Despite two gods being fumbled back to back, we had breached the outer wall and opened a pathway into the main building. It was do or die. Our team stayed outside and bought us time, fighting off Prophecy and distracting them while Jumbie and I charged into the breach. Despite killing a lot of thralls on the way in, there were still swarms of undead in the courtyard, pesky anticlim on the main structure, and palisades dotted throughout, causing us a lot of grief on the way in. We did manage to make it through and found the inner chamber filled with smelter thralls, some fighters, and a bunch of chests, filled with resources that they were likely going to use to rebuild the base. Just as our team had slowly become overwhelmed outside, we bombed out the last of this structure and pulled out. It was a little sloppy and not at all what we hoped for, but in hindsight, Jumpy and I had already hollowed out those back two structures, so all that was really left in this base was exactly what we just managed to steal. So, uh, all in all, successful raid, boys. Big loot gains, you epic plays, good hustle, good hustle, good hustle, good hustle all around, boys. On the opposite side of the map, we made another move on their base at Noob River, the one we were fought off of before. There were still a series of mistakes in the anticline. Not holes, mind you, but areas where you could climb onto a building piece, walk across the fences, and so on until you shimmied your way up to the top. And we had procured another free Jebel Sog altar from one of Prophecy's slave wheels. This time, we brought our friends, and while we held the base of the pillar and fought off those from Prophecy who came to fight, Jumpy unleashed the god on their base, just like we had practiced many times in single player. After a bit of skirmishing on the ground, we all moved up to transfer loot and blast a few of the vaults that remained. And it wasn't so much the damage that we had dealt in these raids, or even their strategic importance that mattered, so much as it was that our team was gradually becoming capable of fighting prophecy. Not for extended amounts of time, of course, we were grossly outnumbered, even on the best of days, but in situations where we would normally be forced to flee immediately, we could install at least and push the raid just a little bit more each time. Out in the wild is where previously we were most vulnerable. If we were caught out and there were more than a few Prophecy members, we were toast. But by the end of the war, we were even winning there. 
More than a few occasions were happening where we bump into them, fight them, and actually win. In the jungle, by the sinkhole, wherever we caught them. We weren't getting ganked anymore. They were. The tides were turning. There was even something of a proxy war that set it all. Two groups of noobs had joined the server at around the same time. One immediately bent over for the Alpha Clans, begged for supplies in exchange for an alliance, and the other clan called the Bretas wasn't afraid to speak truth to power, and we immediately liked them for it. Just because you played a lot, Bretas do not respect this. <laughs> These guys are doing the exact same thing we've been doing, they've just been farming this whole once we learned that Prophecy did in fact give weapons, armor, and explosives to the other noobs who fully intended to use them on Debrutas, we made sure to step in and give them our own support, resulting in a full wipe of these other noobs and the seizing of all the supplies Prophecy had given them. We had shown them the way. It made one thing painfully obvious though. Prophecy wasn't capable of projecting their power like they had been a month and a half before, and the server knew it was a bad time to be an ally of the Prophecy. As we got more organized, we pulled off more difficult raids. Not spectacular, gigantic raids, but the kind of raids we previously couldn't do without a team. There was a base that they had built on the pillar above the Warmaker's dungeon before that dungeon was made, and before the dungeon was released it became a no-build zone, but didn't wipe their base. So effectively, they had a base outside Set City where you couldn't place any explosives on it. So we found the one spot where you could place bombs and literally kicked the explosives into the base and rolled them in with their bodies like playing soccer with a landmine. Until eventually, we cleared that one out too while the team bought time and guarded the obelisk. One base in particular though, always seemed to give us trouble. We'd raid a base that they had built inside Brimstone Lake because of course they have a base inside Brimstone Lake. Cocksucker Alpha Clans think they can do whatever they want. But then we'd swing down afterwards, try for this base, and get fought off. An ally of Prophecy would continuously build large slave wheels just outside Brimstone Lake, so we'd hit that and naturally try to hit this base again right after, only to, again, be fought off. After hitting the pillar base on the Warmaker's Dungeon, we tried again to hit this base and were immediately fought off. This one base, this one stupid base, somehow managed to be the hardest raid of the entire playthrough. The thing is, it was simple. Stupidly simple. It wasn't like the other larger bases, where they were so laggy the thralls barely worked. It wasn't built around a piece of terrain that we could exploit, like how we jumped over the walls of most of their bases. It wasn't even wildly honeycombed. It was just a simple, rectangular base with two perimeter walls and an altar inside. Except this was back when bubbles would protect against arrows, orbs, gods, and trebuchets. Which meant that as long as there was a bubble on this base, the only thing we could do was bomb our way in on foot. Our success relied on strategy, mobility, hit and run tactics, stealth, and a bit of luck. With this base, there just wasn't any trick we could use. We had to fight it head on, and unfortunately for us, that was our biggest weakness. If I was in an encumbrance spec and Jumbi was combat, we really only had maybe one and a half fighters to go against all ten of Prophecy members plus their allies. Of course, they were never all online at the same time, but the odds were never in our favor, even on the best of days. Even if we had our allies on, they'd still have the advantage of all their defenses, their thralls, and their numbers. So despite their base being so simple, it exploited all of our weaknesses by being straightforward. Even as we gained team members, assault in this base wouldn't be easy. The two courtyards were filled with rock noses and king scorpions, which would knock you down and repeatedly stack poison on you. This was back when all healing came from food items and taking damage would interrupt your healing. So unless you cleansed that poison, you just couldn't heal. Making matters worse, the walls were covered with archers, tons of them. If even a single arrow hit you, it would interrupt all of your heals. And because the base was so simple, there weren't any complicated roleplay structures that you could hide behind to break line of sight. Meaning if you were near the base, you couldn't heal. It was just that simple. Essentially, it was almost impossible for us to cheese it at the time as a team of two people. Didn't stop us from trying, of course. We made many attempts to bomb in, but every time they'd respond before we got anywhere. So not only was the base difficult to cheese, but the response time was incredibly fast. Which made sense. The more other bases we destroyed, the fewer that they had to defend, increasing the likelihood of them catching us in the act. But at this point, we were a little desperate for targets. We had already destroyed nearly everything they and their allies had. It caught to the point where Maramusa and I were spending days in the highlands just breaking their vault spam. When you've been reduced to hitting obviously empty vaults just to hit something, you know the war's almost over. But a few things still had to come together over the course of the conflict that wound up tipping the scales and making a raid on this dumb little base possible. Our team, of course, was no longer just two people. Prophecy saw to that. We had gained many eager fighters, warriors, and farmers. We weren't just two crazy guys with a box full of archpriests anymore. We were a team. By now, we even trusted these guys enough to move them into the main base. 
All except uh, poor old man Brink, who bravely made the five minute climb only to be squished immediately by me on accident in the elevator because I was over encumbered. Sorry. As for prophecy, their allies had pulled out of the war. Big Dick Clan, exhausted and defeated, decided it just wasn't worth it anymore. Their bases were wiped, all their slave wheels had been cleaned out, they kicked out a few of the belligerent members of their team and swore to neutrality, which we respected. Prophecy's team was also exhausted, and they were getting fewer and fewer people online for our attacks. Losing for two months straight, we'll do that to a clan though. Prophecy was on the edge, and now all they needed was a push. This time though, the odds were even. We got our gear, our thralls, and our plan together. We didn't realize it then, but this unassuming little base that previously held no importance to anyone would be the site of our final raid, the one that would decide this war. Our strategy was as simple as the base was. We set up a basic raid site with a few dump vaults to carry any valuables we obtained, as well as plenty of healing arrows. This base had well over 100 thralls inside, so we expected to be there a while. Essentially, we'd take it in stages, breaking the outer wall, luring the thralls out in groups, and then grabbing the next batch once those were dead. There were simply too many for us to ignore them, so we had to take our time. Prophecy was slow to respond, and when they did, it was disorganized. They died too quickly to even realize what had happened, but once they saw how many of us there were, they gathered the rest of their team. The field quickly turned into a graveyard, with blood in the sands and in the courtyards. Wave after wave of thralls being put to the sword. Prophecy's impotent attempts at defense only gave us more gear. They were dying as fast as their thralls were. After every wave, we pressed deeper, blasting out of their wall and luring out another wave of thralls. took us the entirety of the raid window and beyond, nearly eight straight hours, but we had finally cleaned it out. We looted every station inside the base and killed so many thralls I had filled my entire inventory with just thrall gear twice over and still had to watch most of it despawn. Easily over 70 thralls slain inside, alongside countless prophecy members. The vault inside didn't load until the very end of the raid window, so unfortunately we missed it, but with the damage we had done, it hardly even mattered. We hollowed out the base and killed almost everything inside. Even if they wanted to rebuild it now, they couldn't. And really, it wasn't even about the raid or what we had done. It was what that victory meant for the war. For the first time, our team was able to fight prophecy head on and win. No tricks. No gods. Just men. And although they had even numbers, a base to resupply at, and countless thralls, they still lost. It marked the precise moment where we had truly become stronger than they were. They weren't the Alphas anymore. Even if they were to rebuild, even if they got more thralls, we could just raid it again. They couldn't defeat us even in the one situation where they always could before, a straight on fight. The war was over, and everybody knew it. Shortly after the fight had finished, one of theirs said this in the global chat. We had finally broken them. The raid was cathartic for a lot of the Langoliers who came. 
several of whom had gotten the worst of Prophecy's paranoia before and were able to farm those rats for eight straight hours. And after such a victory, it only felt right to take a celebratory screenshot. The boys and their victory. After all that, you're probably wondering how this whole story ends, but to get there, we need to go over a few things. Namely, the use of the word cheating in the title of this video, since oddly enough it was most important after our big war. It goes without saying that we had developed more than a few suspicions about our opponents over time. They had engaged in just about every slimy tactic they could. They bullied smaller clans, then told us that they were just role players and called us bullies when they were losing. Perfectly comfortable with choking a server to death with superior numbers and then crying the minute they start losing. They photoshopped discord screenshots, gave away neutral base locations, tried to intimidate us by having people who didn't even play Conan send us cryptic screenshots about an alleged undermesh base. All because we engaged in PvP on a PvP server. But I guess that makes us the griefers. There was more though. Throughout the war they had maintained almost 7 god bubbles consistently, and we were at war for almost 2 straight months, so that's 3,500 NPC kills or for the set altars, thousands of steel and brimstone per bubble every other day for 2 months. Mind you, farming zeal effectively requires killing capital cities worth of NPCs over and over and over again which are high traffic areas that we were also out farming for our own gods, but never once saw them. Not farming resources, not farming NPCs. I think the only time we ever caught them out farming zeal was the one time they wanted a jibble sog to throw at Snug's abandoned base. Additionally, at that time, there was a duping method possible that required you to perform a certain action when the server restarted at 5 in the morning. At the time, I worked really weird hours, so I'd often be on then and curiously they'd have some of theirs log in right at around this time and then log out shortly afterwards. All suspicious, but hardly a smoking gun. And no matter how many bases we wiped, how many vaults we cleared, they always had more resources to build more bases. Again, never found them farming. In fact, we rarely even got farm out of their bases. Mind you, they were throwing thousands of bombs, tons of gods, everything they had at our allies' low tax and snugs bases. Couple this with how some of them seemed to lag whenever they needed to in combat. It was suspicious. The actual smoking gun would come after our time. A clan that joined the server long after the war broke a vault owned by Prophecy near their pagoda and found tons of gear sets all with identical durability damage. Being too lazy to make your own gear is one thing, but too lazy to repair your gear before duping it? Priceless. We never had the proof while we were fighting them, but it was always in the back of our minds. It didn't bother us much though, since it didn't really seem to be helping them much at all. But here we were after finally breaking their spirit. They were in the rubble of their once great kingdom, believing themselves to be the righteous victims of cheating Adermeshing invaders. At this point, they still believed that we were only there because Ashjack paid us to be there, and it was all just one big conspiracy. And judging by the battle metrics logs, their leader was putting sometimes 20 hours a day in, so there was no way he could be thinking clearly anymore. Only base they had left was the Pagoda, and the only reason we didn't wipe that one too was because I lost connection to the server every time I got near it, so it had less to do with our ability to raid it, and more to do with their foundation spam. But in a final act of desperation, he thought, if Ashjack can bring cheaters in to help him, then we can bring in cheaters too. Anything it takes to get revenge. If they couldn't beat us by cheating alone, They'd cheat and outnumber us. You know, uh, more than they already did. We noticed a lot of new faces joining the server, and learned that they were here at the behest of Prophecy. And at this point, we were all but certain Prophecy was cheating, so even if the people they brought in weren't cheating, they would be financed by people who were, so it hardly made a difference. Jumpy and I have never been interested in being the reigning alphas of a server. We show up, fight the big clans, and whether we win or lose, we pick up the pieces and do it all over again. Lording over an empty server and hoarding pixels has just never been our style. And from our perspective, we had already wiped Prophecy. There wasn't much else to do here. If they were reduced to importing more cheaters to fight us, they were more than welcome to squabble over the remains. Some say that to fight cheaters that you should cheat as well, but the way we see it, the minute you start cheating in a game, playing it is pointless. So that behavior to me is truly insane. So we made the decision to leave, rather than fight endless waves of new cheaters. And let me just tell you, that was the wisest choice I've ever made in Conan Exiles, for two reasons. 
Reason number one is that the moment we stopped logging in, we got offline. Now of course we quit, so it's not like they could have online raided us, but the reason I still use that word is because their allies or they themselves apparently knew where we lived for who knows how long. But they still waited weeks for the one day where we stopped logging in to raid us. Big hardcore PvPers, clearly. But we knew that would happen, so we didn't even body vault our stuff. We wanted them to see everything we had was legitimate. I only wish I could have been a fly on the wall for that conversation. Hey, we uh, wiped the Langoliers. Finally, where were they undermashed, pray tell? I've been told their leader sounds like a dweeb in voice chat, so that's actually an authentic impression. Nope, uh, no undermesh, just a cave at the top of the volcano. Completely legitimate. What? Was it difficult at least? Um, not really. I mean, there were some thralls up there, but it wasn't even honeycombed. Cost us maybe, uh, what, 20 bombs? 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 I wish I could have been there to see his face, to learn the truth that after all that suffering, not only were we playing fair the whole time, but our base wasn't even honeycombed. If they had just bothered to climb the extra 20 feet, they could have put an end to all of it. Here's the real kicker though, and reason number two. After finally wiping us big bad quote unquote cheaters and learning the truth, th the Langoliers are gone! We can finally return to being the undisputed alpha! They were immediately betrayed by all the help they brought in, and unlike us, some of them actually were cheating, and would later brag about how many explosives they were able to dupe. In fact, more cheaters came to chase these cheaters and an endless string of cheaters until the entire server was wiped. Jumbi logged in out of curiosity to see that even the pagoda itself had been wiped. The prophecy was no more. Just desserts for clan of scumbags. And so the final twist on a server full of twists? The prophecy they had feared so much of outsiders joining the server and wiping them was finally fulfilled. Not by Assjack, not even by us, but ultimately by themselves. The big bad cheaters that finally did them in were their own guests. Guess they decided they hadn't made enough enemies on one server and decided to invite more, but like I said the first time they went crazy. Never interrupt an opponent while they're making a mistake. I mean really we wiped them, but it makes for a better story if we tell it this way, so just roll with it. We basically joined the server, got a crazy lucky start, experienced two straight months of non-stop victory and conquest, and then left just before the server really went to shit, dodging every headache. Even years later, all of us who were there look back on this server as the one that turned many of us into Conan addicts. It was the ultimate Conan experience. The story of two against many that became more and more. Roaming barbarians making friends and allies, conquering a decadent society, fighting an impossible foe and winning after great struggle and adventure. For how much of a mess this game can be, when it all comes together, it can really give you an experience that no other game can. After this, Jumbi and I went on to greener pastures and fresh servers to engage in new shenanigans, occasionally employing Marimusa's master thieving skills. Miss Geek went on to run a successful solo duo trio server, and I'm sure more than a few of you watching have played on it. Ask Jack and the crew went on to take a nice break from the game, and Snugs did what Snugs always did. He rebuilt his castle, and even now is off building another empire. Marimusa logged into the server much, much later and saw one of the more level-headed members of Prophecy online and said, Hey, you might have hated us, but at least we played fair, huh? They didn't respond. 